On November 18th of 2021, a West Virginia police officer, Everett Maynard, formerly of the Logan, West Virginia Police Department, was found guilty by a federal jury of violating an arrestee's civil rights by using excessive force. Welcome back. I'm civil rights lawyer John Bryan, and the case I'm sharing with you today just happened to come across, uh, or I saw it anyways, in a U.S. DOJ press release here last week, which led me down the rabbit hole of pulling the trial documents and exhibits that were filed with the court in this case. According to the press release, over the course of a two-day trial, the jury heard evidence um, that showed that this police officer Everett Maynard assaulted a victim in the bathroom of the Logan Police Department before dragging him into an adjoining room, hauling him across the room, and ramming his head against a doorframe. The assault initially rendered the victim unconscious and left him with a broken shoulder, a broken nose, and a cut to his head that required staples to close. I'll show you the actual photos presented to the jury, as well as go over the federal law given to the jury which makes it a felony for a police officer to use excessive force causing injury to an arrestee. First, let me go over the law under which he was prosecuted. So, the defendant here, Everett Lee Maynard, was indicted on April 28, 2021 for a single count civil rights violation pursuant to 18 U.S. Code Section 242. The indictment alleged as follows. On or about October 16, 2020, at or near Logan, Logan County, West Virginia, and within the Southern District of West Virginia, the defendant, Everett Lee Maynard, while acting under color of law as a police officer with the Logan Police Department, physically assaulted the arrestee, R.W., a person known to the grand jury, thereby willfully depriving him of the right secured and protected by the Constitution and the laws of the United States, to be free from unreasonable seizures, which includes the right to be free from the use of unreasonable force by a law enforcement officer. The offense resulted in bodily injury to R.W. So the law at issue here, and again, the reason they say unlawful seizure is because the Constitution, um, the constitutional violation here is actually a Fourth Amendment violation. So excessive force always falls under the, the Fourth Amendment unless it's... Um, in the context of a pretrial detainee, which it actually would be in a civil case in this case under the 14th Amendment. In any event, this is a criminal case. The federal criminal statute is, again, 18 U.S.C. 242, deprivation of rights under color of law. Now, the tricky thing here is there's four elements in this prosecution. Only the first two elements are, are necessary for a misdemeanor, and then elements three and four added to them the offense then rises to the level of a felony, which it was here. So, Title 18 U.S. Code Section 242 makes it a crime to deprive any person of his civil rights under color of law. So this is the from the instructions actually given to the jury in this case. For you to find the defendant guilty, the United States must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Number one, the defendant acted under color of law. So he was on duty as a, as a police officer. That wasn't much of an issue. Number two, here's the, the crux of the case. Two, the defendant deprived the victim of a right secured or protected by the Constitution or laws of the United States. Here, the right of an arrestee to be free from unreasonable seizures, which includes the right to be free from the use of unreasonable force by a law enforcement officer. Again, once, once those are proven under color of law and excessive force, that by, by an, in and of itself is a misdemeanor. So now uh, elements three and four, which make it a felony. Number three, the defendant acted willfully. And number four, the defendant's acts resulted in bodily injury to the arrestee. So bodily injury is uh, self-explanatory. What does it mean when it says the defendant acted willfully? Well, there's a long instruction which was given to the jury to explain what that means, but essentially that just means he knew what he was he knew that he was violate he subjectively knew that he was violating the defendant's civil rights he didn't think he was following the you know the department policy or that he wasn't doing anything wrong he knew that he was doing something wrong he was acting willfully okay so that's why it would make um, a pros prosecutions in these sorts of cases really centered on excessive force type cases Okay, I'm going to show you the actual photos which were presented to the jury during the trial. There's also a video. However, the video is not accessible on the court's online public filing system, so I don't have it. But the photos do show the sequence of events. And actually, prior to the trial, 
The defendant officer or former officer announced his intention to use an expert witness at the trial who would use these photos to support a defense theory of a potential accidental use of force. Um, let me read in part from the court's ruling, which excluded that testimony. The United St- This is the court speaking here uh, in writing. The United States alleges uh, that Mr. Maynard, then a police officer with the Logan Police Department, physically assaulted R.W. in the Logan Police Station. It intends to introduce video of the incident. The video depicts Mr. Maynard entering a restroom with the victim shortly after extending his middle finger at the security camera, yelling at him with sounds of an altercation. Mr. Maynard drags R.W. out of the restroom and into view of the security camera and pulls him upright, lifting him from under his arms with both men facing forward. Mr. Maynard, still yelling at the victim, carries him across the room and the victim's head slams into a door frame. The victim collapses onto the ground. Mr. Maynard continues to yell for a moment before observing the victim's injuries and instructing a fellow officer to call for an ambulance, stating, I went to effing far. In the report, Professor Lockhart, this is their their proposed expert witness, opines that, quote, the video images of the incident show significant movement elements that may further exacerbate balance control that may lead to a forward fall accident. And Mr. Maynard was not intending to harm Mr. W by hitting the doorframe. Rather, Mr. Maynard fell forward and reacted in a similar manner as a person falling forwards with a forward carriage load, unquote. He further states, quote, In my opinion, Mr. W's unstable mass in the anterior direction may have created balance per- perturbations that needed to be corrected or compensated in order to continue wa- to walk without falling. In addition, quote, In my opinion, due to a significant front load related to carrying Mr. W in resistances, several safety walking was compromised. He explains the mechanisms for the increased risk of falls while carrying a heavy load in front of the body. The report cites several articles, all except one, authored or co-authored by Professor Lockhart. However, the court wasn't having it and did not allow this theory, uh, this evidence, to go to the jury. Here's what the court basically held. Using scientific language to convey simple concepts of risks causing confusion and is unlikely to help the jury. The report of the expert contains analysis of the video and still images drawn from the video with descriptions of those images. Jurors are perfectly capable of viewing the video and images without expert guidance. The question presented will be whether Mr. Maynard tripped or deliberately slammed RW into the doorframe. The jury will determine whether Mr. Maynard acted intentionally based on all the evidence presented, including his actions and words in the video, in the moments immediately before and after R.W. hit the doorframe. Further, as the United States argues, permitting an expert to testify regarding either Mr. Maynard's own exculpatory statements or his state of mind would be wholly inappropriate and well outside the scope of Professor Lockhart's area of expertise. So basically, the jurors do not need an expert witness to tell them what they see on the video when they're perfectly capable of seeing the video uh, themselves and analyzing what happened. Um, Because the risk of doing so would possibly confuse the jury and also might allow the expert to sneak in um, exculpatory statements or testimony from a defendant who may not, he may choose not to testify at trial. So that's sort of a, a dirty, you know, a dirty trick that the prosecutors here are trying to avoid. And that gets us to really the most important jury instruction. And why are we here? When is it excessive force when a police officer uses force on somebody during an arrest? At what point does it become a felony federal crime? Or at what point is it justified? Well, here is the actual jury instruction on that, on element two of this charge to the jury in this case. The Constitution prohibits the use of unreasonable or excessive force by a law enforcement officer making an arrest. A use of force violates the Constitution if it is excessive under objective standards of reasonableness. Unreasonable force is thus physical force that exceeds the objective need for such force. Although a law enforcement officer may use force if there is an objective basis to do so, he may not use more force than is reasonably necessary under the circumstances. For example, a law enforcement officer may use force to make an arrest, prevent a suspect from escaping custody, or to defend himself or another from bodily harm. 
However, the law enforcement officer may not use more force than is reasonably necessary to accomplish these objectives. An officer may not use force merely because an arrestee questions an officer's authority, insults the officer, uses profanity, or otherwise engages in ver verbal provocation, unless the force was otherwise objectively reasonable at the time it was used. And these are all, as an aside, based on different cases, mostly in the Fourth Circuit. Additionally, an officer may not use force solely to punish, retaliate against, or seek retribution against another person. If you find that the defendant used force against R.W., then you must decide whether that force was reasonable. You should make this decision considering all the facts and circumstances from the point of view of an ordinary and reasonable officer on the scene at the moment force was used. In making your determination, you may consider the severity of the crime, if any, committed by R.W., the extent, if any, to which R.W. posed a threat to the safety of the defendant or to any other person at the time that force was used, and the extent, if any, to which R.W. was physically resisting arrest or attempting to flee at the time force was used. You may also consider the injuries, if any, suffered by R.W. Now, those were basically the Graham factors from the Supreme Court case Graham v. Connor. And that tells me that the court was doing this under the Fourth Amendment analysis rather than the Fourteenth Amendment analysis uh, of a pretrial detainee. And it could be either way when you're looking at inside a police department. So, therefore, the court probably concluded that the arrest, the person was not yet under arrest, had not yet become a pretrial detainee when the force was used. And again, really the, the details the, uh, that I've given you are really all that's out there. They haven't given uh, much more details than that. In fact, as you see, the, even the name of the individual arrested is used in initials. Um, and let's see. In determining whether the force was used, is almost over here. Whether the force used was reasonable under all the facts and circumstances, keep in mind that force that is objectively reasonable at the beginning of an encounter may not be justified even seconds later if the objective justification for the initial use of force has been eliminated. That's important in a lot of cases, including in my, my last video. If, after considering all the circumstances, you find that the defendant used objectively unreasonable force against R.W., then you may find that this element has been satisfied. So, you know, I'm surprised that this case wasn't more publicized. You know, civil rights lawsuits for money damages are one thing, but cases like this have a huge deterrent effect on these types of incidents. Money damage lawsuits are almost never paid by the individual officers are almost always, well, really 100% of the time, 99.99% of the time, any damages awarded are paid by insurance companies. So it may or may not have any deterrent effect, but federal criminal prosecution is absolutely terrifying and will absolutely have a deterrent effect. Uh, you know, let me know what you think in the uh, comments section. If you have a case or a video you would like me to see or review, you can find my contact info on the website at thecivilrightslawyer.com. Also, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching.